One major thing that C-sharp added on top of the baseline of Java is that C-sharp has what are called structs, which are these things that are very much like classes, but for two differences. First off, they're value types rather than reference types, and they cannot use inheritance. So you can't have a struct inherit from some other struct or class or anything. So the fact that they're struct types, what that means is that here where we have struct cat rather than class cat, if I create a variable C of type cat, this variable stores a cat value directly. All the data elements that make up a cat, that's this one piece of data in memory, and C is not going to store a reference, it's going to store an actual cat value directly. And so here we create values of struct types just like we create instances of classes, but when we assign a struct value to a variable or pass it as an argument into a method or set it as the value of a field, in all those cases, the value itself is being copied, not any reference. So here, the cat value created by this operator is being copied in whole to variable C. Here we're setting the age to five, and if we create another cat variable C2 and assign it the value of C, well, we're copying the value of C to C2, and we now have two separate copies. C and C2 are holding separate copies of separate cats. They're not storing separate copies of the same reference, they're storing actually separate cats. And so immediately after this assignment, we can retrieve the value of age of C2, and it's the value five, because C2 and C after this assignment, all their fields have the same values. But then if we set age of C2 to nine, that is affecting age of C2, not C. If we immediately after get the age of C, we'd still just get five, because this set here only affected the cat value stored in C2, not the cat value stored in C. Again, C and C2 are directly storing totally separate cats. So that is the distinction between reference types and value types. Question is, why do you ever want to use struct types rather than class types? Well, there are cases where dealing with values through references uh, incurs significant overhead. Because every time we read and write data through references, that's two memory lookups rather than just one. So actually there are trade-offs. If we had a very large struct with many fields, uh, then you'd have this thing that takes up many bytes potentially. And so every time you did an assignment or uh, passed it into a method or returned a struct out of a method, well, then that means copying a significant number of bytes. Whereas if you're dealing with just references, then references are always the same size no matter what they reference. And so when dealing with large data types, it's often more efficient to pass around references to those large pieces of data uh, rather than copy the things in full. So there's really no definitive rule about when to use classes and structs. In general, though, structs are used for smaller pieces of data and classes are used for everything else. Class is sort of the default, and for certain cases where you know it would be more efficient, you might decide to use a struct instead. A very common practice is to give classes getter and setter methods. These are methods which get and set the values of the fields, such that users of the class should call these methods rather than getting and setting the fields directly. Here, for example, rather than having users of this cat class directly access the age field through get and set, we've created a get age and set age method. Get age just returns the value of the field, and set age has an int parameter, which is what we set the age field to be. So elsewhere in code, say we have this cat C, rather than using the set and get operators, I call set age and get age, and it has the same effect. What is the point of doing this? Why not just use get and set? Well, it's a debatable point of style the argument is made is that by uh, adding this level of indirection, we then have more control over what happens when the field of our class is accessed. Because maybe right now, yes, when they get the age, they just get the value from the field verbatim. But what if, say, you wanted to add logic to your code where uh, every time the age is accessed, we lie about the age. So then we would have something that looks like this. Instead of returning the age verbatim, we get the age from the field, but then subtract two. So then down here, we should see printed out six rather than eight. This is a highly artificial example, of course, but I think it gets across the idea. If the user of a class always goes through these getter and setter methods, then down the line, we can intercede what happens when that field is accessed by modifying the code in these methods. Because getters and setters are so common, c -sharp has what are called properties, which get us the very same effect. So here, same code, except now instead of those getter and setter methods, we have this property called age of type string. And because we can't have a name collision between our properties and fields, we change the actual age field to be called age field rather than just age. And the property has a get method, which implicitly always just returns a value of this type and takes no inputs, and a setter method, which returns nothing and takes a value of this type 
And implicitly, that input parameter is called value. There's a special word value inside your setter, which refers to the value which is being set. So logically, we have this property with the same getter and setter logic, but as you see here, when we use the property, we do so using get and set operations. When I set property age of C, it's not necessarily just a simple assignment of the field. Though in this case, all it's doing is it's taking the value and setting the field. But it could do other stuff. We could put whatever logic we want in here. Likewise, when I get property age of C, it's not just directly accessing the field, it's performing this logic. So the idea of properties is that you end up with getter and setter methods that are a little less verbose to create, number one, and these methods are invoked by doing an ordinary get and set. Properties probably seem quite pointless in the context of this C-sharp pigeon language, but in actual C-sharp, in the actual notation, the syntax, it is quite a bit less verbose when we create properties rather than creating getter and setter methods. An array is like a list, but it's fixed in size and it also has a fixed type. So say I can create an array of integers and when I create that array, I have to specify how many elements it's gonna hold, whether five, 10, 50, 100, whatever. Here in this first line of code, we're creating a variable nums, which is an array of integers. That's what this notation means. The A stands for array, and in the angle brackets, we specify what kind of array we're talking about. In this case, we want nums to store an array of integers. And understand that arrays are reference types. So really what this is gonna store is not directly store an array of integers, it's gonna store a reference to an array of integers. To actually create an array of integers, we use the new operator, specifying we're creating here an array of integers, and we specify the size, in this case five. So this creates a new array of five integers, and this operation returns the reference to that new array, which is then stored in nums. And then the len operator here, as in length operator, is telling us the length of the array, in this case five. Next, we create another array of integers, but this is an array of three integers rather than five, and we're assigning that to nums. So previously nums was referencing this array of five integers, but now that's being overridden and now nums references this array of three integers, a separate smaller array. And so now if we do len nums, we get back three. So understand that arrays come in particular types, like say array of integers or arrays of strings or arrays of cats or whatevers, but the actual array values, the instances you might call them, those also have a type, but they have a fixed size. So as far as the compiler is concerned, the type here is array of integers, but then the actual values of that type come in different sizes. And so we can assign to nums here arrays of different sizes, as long as they're arrays of the correct type. What's not valid is if here, if I were creating an array of strings rather than integers, well, the compiler will be unhappy with this line because nums is expecting an array of integers, not strings. And so this is an invalid assignment. Anyway, I'll put that back, make an array of integers, and now it's fine. And then once we have our array, we can then set and get the elements of the array. So here we're setting to index zero of this nums array, we're setting the value there to be 89. And then down here, we don't actually need this line, let me get rid of that. Uh, when we use the get operator on our array, we specify the index of which value we want to retrieve. And now having set index zero to be 89, if we retrieve that, we get the end value 89. Get nums one gets us zero because when you create an array, all the values start out with their default for that type. And for integers, as you would expect, the default value is zero. For floats, it's 0.0. .0. For booleans, it's false. And for reference types, it's null. So like say if I had an array of strings, then initially all of the values are null. Anyway, so if I get nums two, that also gives us zero because it hasn't been changed from its default value. And if I get nums three, well, that's out of bounds. Our array only has three elements indexes 0, 1, and 2, 3 is outside that bounds, so this is a runtime error. Again, the compiler never presumes to know what the value of any variable is, and so it doesn't know what the length of nums is. It doesn't know if it's an array of 3 ints, or 10, or 1,000, or a million, whatever. It doesn't know. And so it doesn't catch this error at compile time. Only at runtime, when this operation actually runs, does it say, oh, that index is invalid, and then it throws an out-of-bounds exception. Now here, Let's assume that once again we have a class called reptile and a class called snake which inherits from reptile. And so here if we create an array of reptiles, size 3, and assign that to variable r which is a reference of type array of reptiles, well then we can set to index 0 of r, the first index, we can set it of course to be a new reptile instance. So this is creating a new reptile and storing its address 
in the first index of this array of reptiles. Here, we're setting index one of the same array to be the same value stored in index zero. So now effectively, the first two indexes of the array are referencing this same reptile that we created here. And then lastly, we're setting index two to be a snake. And this is valid because as far as the compiler is concerned, snakes are reptiles. Any place a reptile is expected, we can have a snake instead because snake inherits from reptile. So this creates a new instance of the snake class and stores the reference to it in index two of this array. However, be clear that the compiler considers R to be an array of reptiles. It doesn't presume to know what the actual values stored in the array are, so it doesn't know that this particular index is actually a snake and not a reptile. So down here, when we get R2, the get operation on R is always, as far as the compiler is concerned, going to return a value of type reptile. We know at runtime it's actually going to be a snake in this case, but the compiler doesn't know, and so it doesn't like this assignment. We can't assign a value retrieved from this array of reptiles to the snake variable. We can, though, of course, perform a cast. As far as the compiler is concerned, this operation returns a reptile, but then we're casting to snake and asserting, well, at runtime it's actually going to be a snake. The compiler is now happy, and at runtime, this cast operation is doing a check of, hey, wait, are you really actually a snake? If not, I'm going to throw an exception. Otherwise, it returns the snake instance. So this is just like what we saw with variables. If I have a reptile variable storing a snake, the compiler doesn't presume to know that it's a snake. We have to do a cast to get the snake instance stored in a reptile reference. And here, for the elements of arrays, it's the same deal. If you're wondering whether C-sharp has lists and maps, the answer is yes, along with many other collection types, but they are not considered to be built-in features of the language. Instead, they are just classes of the standard library. The C-sharp standard library comes with many classes for various functionality, including lists, maps, and other collections. But we won't get into that here. Instead, we'll get into that when we look at the real, actual C-sharp language. One more thing to discuss before getting into actual C-sharp is what are called generics. Here we have this class Alice, which is a generic class as distinguished by these angle brackets. Inside the angle brackets, we have these two type parameters, Bob and Carol, which within the class will stand in effectively for types to be supplied later. So here when you say that field X has type Bob, we're saying, well, it doesn't have any particular type yet in this class, but when we create an actual instance of Alice, we specify what type Bob is going to be. And so in one instance of Alice, Bob could be a string. In another instance, it could be an integer. And so from one instance of Alice to the next, the actual type of Bob can vary. Same for Carol. We say here that field Z is of type Carol, but what type it is specifically will be filled in when we actually create an instance of Alice. The compiler, though, for that instance will enforce consistency. If I say that my field Z here is of type Carol, and I say that also this method foo has a parameter B of type Carol, then for my instance, whatever type Carol is, whether it's a string or a cat or a dog or whatever, both the field Z and this parameter B, their types have to match up. Same thing for the field X and the return type of foo, because they're both Bob. Whatever Bob's going to be for a particular instance of Alice, those two types have to be the same. So then, down here, if I create a variable A of type Alice, I specify in the angle brackets, for this particular Alice variable, what kind of Alice is it? A normal class, a non-generic class, is a blueprint for instances, but a generic class is like a blueprint for classes. It's a blueprint for blueprints. So I have to specify here particular types for Bob and Carol. In this case, I'm saying Bob will be an integer and Carol will be Boolean. And here where I create an instance of Alice, I also specify what the types for Bob and Carol are going to be. And note that the types of my instance are matching up with the type for my variable. Otherwise, the compiler would not accept the assignment. So on the next line, when I create variable B of type Alice, where Bob is float and Carol is string, then the instance of Alice I assign to it has to have those same types. When I then use A here, the compiler knows A to have the type Alice, where Bob is I, and Carol is bool. So when I set the field Z of A, the compiler is expecting a boolean. And so this is a valid set operation. When I get field X of A, the compiler knows that field X for A is going to have the type int. And so the value returned by this get can be assigned to variable I here of type integer. When though we try and assign B to A, or vice versa, we'll get a compilation error, because even though A and B are both instances of Alice, well, they're different kinds of instances, and the compiler knows that, so it doesn't consider A and B to have the same type. Just to be thorough here, if we're gonna call foo on instance A, well, then it'll look like this, uh, some float, and then Carol is gonna be a Boolean, so let's just say false, 
So this is an acceptable call because, for instance, A, Carol is Boolean, so it's expecting a Boolean for this last parameter, and the call returns an integer. So, in short, a generic class is a class which has type parameters, in this case two, Bob and Carol, and for particular instances of the class, we specify what those types will be. So we can have a class where one or more types aren't necessarily locked down. As we'll see in real C-sharp, what this is most commonly useful for are collection types, things like lists and maps. Because if we want to define a class representing, say, a list, we want to be able to write just one class which represents lists of any type. We want to be able to have lists of strings and lists of integers and lists of cats. And we want the compiler to distinguish between those types so that it knows that a list of strings is not the same thing as a list of cats. If I have an instance of my list class, which is supposed to be a list of cats, I want the compiler to stop me if I try and add something to my list which is not a cat. That is what generics make possible.